Hello, everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel. And today I have another video for you all. Today, we do unfortunately have another Marilyn Manson update to cover, as well as updates to a story I have not talked about in a very long time, which is for the Australian BDSM cult known as the House of Catafor. Now, it has only been <laughs> two weeks, I think, since the last time that we have talked about Manson, and there is already so much that has happened, and I'm gonna try really hard to get in as much as I can in this video, but there are some like smaller little things that I know I'm gonna miss out on, and those will be described down below, as well as links to some of the news articles about them. I guess Bandit will be joining us for at least part of the story today, but again, so much has happened with Manson, and I am only really planning on doing this one in December now, and then taking a break for at least a couple of weeks, just because because again, these are really hard topics to cover and I know all of you probably want a break. I know I kind of want one. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. The first big thing that happened right after I posted the last video I did was Rolling Stone came out with a huge expose on Manson where they interviewed over 55 people. It is a massive piece of journalism. If you have some time, you know, a bus ride, a train ride, a couple hours in the afternoon, sit down, read it. There's so much in there. I'm gonna be going over the highlights that really stuck out to me as new information, namely around Manson's upbringing and how he kind of shifted from Brian Warner into the Marilyn Manson we know him as today. One of the very famous stories we have talked about before, for example, is the allegation that Marilyn Manson, according to himself in his own autobiography, right, he allegedly hit his mother with a perfume bottle and then permanently scarred her as a result. Now, this was brought up, or at least some of his behavior with his mother was brought up by an old family friend named Tim Vaughn, who was one of the people interviewed by Rolling Stone. And he had this to say. He remembers Warner frequently cursing and screaming at Barbara. Once, Vaughn recalls, he chased her down the hallway with a microphone stand. I asked him, what the fuck is wrong with you? He's like, the bitch is always coming in at the worst times, which is such a strange thing to say. And I'll talk about this, I think, later on. But this is a random old family friend. Like, what do they have to gain by having their name publicly associated with a massive journalistic effort of investigating Marilyn Manson? Like, what is in it for him? He's not an actor. He's not an actress. He's just some guy. So keep that in mind. Now, further along in the Manson story, he apparently moved to Fort Lauderdale when he was 18 and he went to Broward County College for a time and he eventually ended up getting a job where he was actually a journalist himself covering music. His former editor remarked, quote, he had a lot of anger and hostility but he was a very quiet person. You know, the kind you expect was going to be a serial killer someday. Rather than the so-called goth mantle he dons today, at the time he was said to wear brown corduroys and surfer t-shirts. And Marilyn Manson eventually, through the course of interviewing musicians, decided he no longer wanted to be the one doing the interviews, but wanted to be the one being interviewed. He wanted to become famous and become a musician. And apparently the name Marilyn Manson was actually a name that he had used previously for storytelling. And he adapted that character to not just be in his stories, but then become his musical persona. And it didn't seem to take him very long to transition from awkward Ohio boy wearing brown corduroys into the Manson we know him as today. Allegedly, he had women in cages that he would kick on stage even during very early performances. And he also is said to have taped every woman that he had sex with, which 
reminds me of someone, but I'm not sure quite who. Hi, my name's Dennis Reynolds, and I'm here to show you how to make a sex tape. And this was confirmed by Tim Vaughn, the family friend that we mentioned earlier, who is said to have been shown these tapes. And Laura Werder, the former president of the band's fan club, said that Manson regularly received compromising photos from underage fans. Now, I think the most telling thing in the article out of everything for me is this quote from a former bandmate. I don't remember any drugs when we were hanging out. He didn't even drink. He was willing to sacrifice who he was to become this character he created. Whatever I do, whatever I say, I am Marilyn Manson now, Warner said in 2003. I can't turn it off. And that is just chilling and I, I don't know what else to say about it besides that. And that's why I call him Marilyn Manson and not Brian Warner because I think those two personas or personalities, whatever they are, I think they have really fused together. And even Manson doesn't seem to know how to drop one and become just the other again. Now, next up on the docket, we do have some updates for Evan Rachel Wood, who is probably Marilyn Manson's most well-known accuser. She was really the first, I think, to spearhead talking about allegations against Manson publicly. And as a result, she has gotten, at least from my experience in my own comments, a disproportional amount of hatred as a result. And so even though she's really been talked about a lot, there haven't been a lot of updates, but now we do have something, actually one of Evan Rachel Wood's co-workers on the set of Westworld talking about her experience involving Marilyn Manson being on set and observing Evan Rachel Wood while they did work together. Quote, I would believe every single thing Evan has said about Marilyn Manson because we were there, Emmy Award winning producer Eileen Landris is quoted saying, he came to visit once. And I remember the vodka bottle flying out of the trailer. She would come to work in bad shape. She would come to work like the train had run her over. Pretty much every morning, if I saw Evan Rachel Wood, the first question would be, where's the medic? She was in a rough place. And the reason why I bring up this very, very short little story is that this is more cooperation of some of the allegations that we've seen from so many people and Manson's behavior from somebody that is not one of his lovers or personal assistants or ex-bandmates, though those are important people to hear from, you're hearing it from somebody that is literally just an outside observer, a co-worker of somebody that he dated and noticing that behavior and remembering it years later even. And so again, that's why I bring it up. I think it's important to notice just those little tiny moments where you're hearing those similar stories from outside parties and uh, he really just seemed to like throwing things, vodka bottles, axes, knives, it just seems to be part of his MO. But another update that we have from Evan Rachel Wood, or at least about her, is actually involving her custody battle with former partner, Jamie Bell. Now, normally you would think, isn't that just celebrity gossip? What does that have to do with Marilyn Manson at all? And to be fair, it kind of is. The Daily Mail actually broke this story because they shared some of the court documentation coming out of this dispute, which disturbingly does seem to involve Manson. Quote, the rock musician even told Westworld actress and ex-girlfriend Evan Rachel Wood he would, quote, fuck her eight-year-old son, she said in a declaration to the court. I only recently learned that Manson was involved in human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of minors on a large scale. She said one of Manson's other alleged victims recorded him saying he had pictures of her children going to their mailbox as well as their social security numbers. He allegedly said he knew where all of the people who had created his problems were. I know where they live, where their fucking kids go to school, where they work, their parents. Wood said she had been deluged with death threats since making her allegations against Manson in February. You are taking Manson from me. I'll take your life, one of the messages read. Others said, we know where you fucking live and I'm about crazy enough to come kill you myself. And while I don't really want to comment on the rest of the paternity case, because that does seem really just going a step 
too far like what does Jamie Bell and her kid have to do with this? I say just leave them out as much as possible. And also I don't think the Daily Mail had their permission to share these documents, but who knows? But I will say those death threats are just awful and on a basic level do not help prove the point that Marilyn Manson is innocent. I really think regardless of what side you are on, death threats to anyone, just don't do it. It's not appropriate. It doesn't help your case. Why go to that level? It just, it really, really seems super gross to me. Now, one thing I want to bring up because I know a lot of people have doubts about the validity of these claims is Evan Rachel Wood was willing to put these allegations in a court document. And I know this is family court, so maybe it doesn't seem as severe as an actual criminal case, but if she is found to be lying in those documents or is telling falsehoods, that would be risking perjury. And I know that not many people get convicted of perjury, but at least, even if that doesn't happen, if she is found to be lying in order to have access to her son, I think the courts would go towards not allowing her to have access to her kids. So I think that in my mind, again, does make it seem more honest, or at least that Evan Rachel Wood does believe that these threats are true. And I would just keep that in mind when you are reading these things, there is risk here to lying. It's not like you get to lie and <laughs> nothing bad will happen to you. Like there are consequences, especially when that stuff is going in front of a judge. Now, speaking of the courts, we do have one more update to another case actually about the Jane Doe lawsuit, which has been in the news a little bit more recently compared to Evan Rachel Wood's allegations, but there was a court date set for that lawsuit going forward, which is not going to be until October of 2023. As you may remember, this lawsuit was originally dismissed due to some issues involving the statute of limitations, which I covered in detail before. A link to that video will be down below if you wanna hear about that. But it does seem that there are additional clarifications around some of the things that happened and the results of the alleged abuse does seem to have satisfied the courts and now they are moving forward with the case, albeit very slowly and that is really how things go they can go very very fast for a short period of time and then it's waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting now in the article that talked about when this court date was being set there was a very interesting response from the members of manson's legal team there are other cases that are somewhat related and so as things progress we may decide that it's best to have a global mediation I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but it is in the cards. And I think that is very interesting. And there could be many reasons for this. The time necessary, saving expenses, maybe not wanting evidence to be out in public or talked about in court records that people may report on in the news. Who knows what could be going on there. What I really hope is in the end, no matter what happens, what direction it goes, settlement, court, anything else, that the victims that are making these allegations get whatever healing they need and have their day in court if they want it. But if they decide settling is easier for them mentally, emotionally, they just want things to rest. I think that is perfectly acceptable as well. And time will tell what direction these things end up going in. Now, I do have one more piece of information about Marilyn Manson that I have been saving until the very end here because it is a very, very, very big piece of news, which is that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department has raided Marilyn Manson's house. Now, we have spent a lot of time, even in this video, focusing on the civil proceedings against Manson, but very quietly in the background, there has been a criminal investigation that has been so quiet that many people on social media, Twitter, Instagram, have been routinely calling for there to be updates about the case to talk to lawmakers in Los Angeles, to talk to the sheriff's department directly and request updates and just keeping that pressure on the investigation. And that does seem to have paid off because they have been very, 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 very quiet about this to the point where it seemed like they weren't doing anything. And all of a sudden, 
something really big happened. They raided Marilyn Manson's house and reportedly they did seize some items. They also in particular seized media storage devices, which are most likely hard drives from computers. I like to imagine there could also be a VHS tape or two in there as well, but who knows? Manson was not at home at the time that the raid was conducted, so he was not involved in this whatsoever. Don't know what his reaction to this is, don't know what his legal response will be, and it will be very telling to see what happens next because they could be moving very quickly. We don't really know where this lines up in their investigation timeline. We don't know if this is like the first step or the step right before they charge him with something. I don't really care how fast it happens, honestly. What I wanna prioritize is having a clean, thorough investigation where they can really get some precise charges on him that they have direct evidence for. So they don't have any room for him to like wiggle out of something on a technicality or something being wrong with how they collected the evidence or whatever. Like I want things to be clean and neat and not have any problems. That's all I really am asking for here. And it seems like with how tight they have been with information, not letting anything out to like TMZ or the Daily Mail that we are hopefully going more in that clean cut direction, but who knows? And it will be very interesting to see how quickly they end up moving after this. So my one exception to taking a break on the Manson case will be if they arrest and charge Manson, I will cover that, but otherwise I will be taking a break. Now, we do have one other story that actually does parallel the current pathway for the Marilyn Manson criminal investigation somewhat, which is the Australian BDSM cult known as the House of Catafor, which we last covered many months ago and has been now working through the Australian legal system and more and more developments have been happening, which I want to cover now. If you didn't happen to catch the last video that I did talking about the House of Catafor, I will give a quick summary here. So basically the main allegations are against James Robert Davis, who is the master of the household. He had a group of submissive and slave women that lived with him in a remote part of Australia in kind of a compound sort of polycule scenario. He also had a YouTube channel at one point where he shared information about his lifestyle and his relationships. And he also attempted to have an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter where he wanted to have a documentary fully going into the details of his MS poly lifestyle, which did not end up getting funded. And even though there were rumors about him swirling for a very long time, ranging from him going after high school aged girls to recruit into BDSM relationships over to mind control and brainwashing, nothing was ever really done about his behavior, even though he was unwelcome in several very large Australian BDSM spaces. It wasn't really until a thorough investigation was done by a news network that anything was done about him and pretty much like right after <laughs> this piece came out, they basically went after Robert as soon as possible, slammed him with slavery charges and raided the compound where he lived, including seizing things like hard drives and taking extensive documentation of everything they found there. Now, since then it has been kind of going through the legal system in Australia and not being a lawyer and especially especially not being a lawyer in Australia, I really don't understand the finer legal points. So I don't wanna go into that in too much detail, but I do wanna cover how things have been progressing. As I said, they originally got him on slavery charges, but actually back in September, they dropped those slavery charges in favor of a litany of 18 new <laughs> charges, which included among other things, possessing, soliciting and distributing child pornography, sexual intercourse without consent, assault, firearm charges, and even torturing an animal to death. So not all things you really wanna hear together on one list, I feel like. And in total, that makes for 58 separate charges in a 91 page fact sheet 
for reference, most fact sheets are about at most four to five pages. So the information here is extensive. He was even considered to be such a danger for the public and such a flight risk that they didn't allow him to leave police custody in order to witness the birth of his newest child, which I think really speaks volumes for how seriously they are taking these charges and how much they have considered everything that he's done. Now, obviously, it does appear that Davis is their main focus. He is the one that got charged first and the hardest, but it would appear that other members of Davis's inner circle don't have clean hands themselves. One infamous member locally of the Catafor group is known as Hunter or Grace, and she had a fraught entry into the world of BDSM, let's say, and not in the way that you might be thinking. It started with her lying about her age in order to get onto FetLife. If you know anything about FetLife, you know that it is 18 plus only, and she was on there when she was only 16, and lying about her age, including lying about her age actively to people that she was interacting with and having sex with, and eventually she did end up getting into the sphere of the House of Catafor and became part of their group and was taken on by Davis as a submissive and started to make pornography with them and started to make other illicit material with them when she was still only 16, which is where we get one of the first legal problems here, which is in New South Wales, which is the part of Australia they are in, the minimum age of consent is 16. However, it is an offense to access, transmit, publish, distribute, possess, supply, or produce child abuse material through a carriage service. The internet is a carriage service according to this law, and this rule applies to anyone under 18. So even though the age of consent is 16, it doesn't mean that it's legal to produce pornography containing someone that is 16 years of age, which is what it seems like was happening here. And even though Hunter started out as the subject of many of these things, it seems like in adulthood, she has now moved into participating and facilitating these things as well, not too dissimilar to what Davis has done. And now she has also been charged as well in relation to the ongoing House of Catafor investigation. This includes six counts of using the internet to plan for or prepare to have sex with someone under the age of 16. It includes five counts of using the internet to transmit child pornography and one count of possession of a restricted substance, in this case, morphine, which is weird until you realize that Hunter is a nurse with a restricted license, and that might be where that charge is coming from. Now, I could go into more detail about all of the allegations here and the background of Hunter slash Grace and the entire web of people involved here, but there is a really, really wonderful website that is called Catafor Exposed that has been documenting this family behind the scenes for years. And they are really responsible for so much of this coming to light. And anything that I have to say would really just be riding on their coattails. And if you want to, the website does go in and out of being available, but I would go through and read it if it is available, really get all of the details and screenshots and posts because so much of what has happened over the years involving the House of Catafor is no longer available. It has really been scrubbed from the internet and they have been doing a really good job of trying to preserve that information. So again, please check out Catafor Exposed because they have so much more information than what I can share. But I do wanna add as someone that is very involved in the BDSM lifestyle, it is literally my job, it is disgusting to hear these allegations. It is absolutely repulsive to me that people like this could be part of our community, could be exploiting the label of BDSM and the language of BDSM in order to enable their 
systematic abuse and exploitation of people, including minors. It is, they are not what the BDSM world is about. This is not representative of the kink community. And I cover this because I'm very nervous of either the court itself or the media confusing what is happening here that is abuse with what is consensual BDSM. There is nothing wrong with having a household, with having a slave that is consensual and negotiated. There is nothing wrong with being submissive or being a master or doing BDSM things. It is when it gets into being abusive and being exploitative that it becomes an issue. And I don't think a lot of people really understand the nuance to be able to tell where the BDSM stops and that abuse begins. So I will continue to give updates on this as things come out. It is trickling in very slowly and it'll be interesting to see what further developments do end up happening. It'll probably be another couple months before I talk about this again. And I would love to hear what you'll have to say down in the comment section below on anything that I covered, whether that be Marilyn Manson getting raided or the House of Catafor and the updates there. Anything else I mentioned, please let me know what you think down below. And I will also, again, put updates for the other little bits and pieces of news that I couldn't fit in here in the description box if you want to read that as well. All of my sources will be there too. If you did enjoy this, if you have not already, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about usually BDSM and kink related topics, which I would consider this to be because Manson, the House of Catafor, it is all very much intertwined with the use of BDSM as a defense in the legal system where I personally think it is inappropriate to do so. But that being said, if you did enjoy this video, again, please do subscribe. If you really want to support my channel and you have not already, please do check out my Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.